All right, tomorrow is the Homeland Terrorism Conference, and this evening we have with us Dr. Mark Pfeiffer, we have Lieutenant Colonel Roy White, we have Dr. Stephen Branson, and we have uh, Reverend Joe Carey. And we wanted to do a roundtable discussion tonight. Uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee just happened. Anyone want to start with uh, what we're really facing in this country? Joe? Hmm. What we're facing, it, I'm going to mention this a little bit tomorrow morning as kind of my, my intro to, to my session, my first session. I think what we're facing, at least in our, in our political system and in our media, is a lack of knowledge about the ideology that's actually driving these things. They want to cover it up. Uh, they want to turn a blind eye to the, the ideology that's, that's driving these terrorists to do what they're doing. Um, somebody posted, in fact, I should, I should pull my cell phone out because I, I posted something on Facebook last night um, after it was revealed that the gentleman who was supposed to be the trigger man posted a blog Monday, posted some comments on, on his blog, and one of them had to do with, with Allah. And let me just read it to you here. It was, it was very interesting. Fox News reports that Abdulaziz kept a blog that had just two entries. He made two entries Monday. And both, both, um, both blog entries had to do with Islam. The first one refers to a hypothetical test designed to, as the writer puts it, separate the inhabitants of paradise from the inhabitants of hellfire. Now, what's he talking about? Our media is scratching their heads trying to figure out, what, what's this guy mean? What does this blog entry mean? If they would just go to the Quran, they would find out exactly what this blog entry is talking about. How, how do you separate the, the inhabitants of paradise from the inhabitants of hellfire? We have an example in the Bible, in Matthew 25, where Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. And he talks about what that looks like. Well, Allah has a way of separating his sheep from his goats as well. It's found in the Quran. Let me just give you a couple of examples of, of verses that, that come to mind. Surah 9, verse 38. Believers, what's the matter with you that when you were asked to march forth in the cause of Allah, that is jihad, you cling to the earth? Do you prefer the life of this world to the hereafter? Unless you march, he will afflict you and punish you with a painful torture and put others in your place. That seems to be pretty clear to me what this guy was blogging about. Um, Surah 9 verse 20. Those who believe and suffer exile and strive with might and main in all this cause, with their goods and with their persons, with their lives, have the highest rank in the sight of Allah. These are the people who will achieve salvation. So they're doing these things because they're after that goal of paradise. Yeah. The ideology is driving them to do the things that they, that they do. And our media and our political system wants to turn a blind eye to it. They don't want to identify what's going on here. Who else wants to add to that? Well, I would just add that I think this is only uh, not even the first. There will be many more incidents like this. Uh, th this is not a one-off, a strange, crazed guy. Uh, I think we're, this is just a part of our reality, and it's going to be this way for the foreseeable future. Any potential answers to how to handle this situation? Well, I think that we'll have to have, our politicians will have to have the will, uh, which I don't, they won't, but uh, they would have to have the will to become much more focused and aggressive and proactive in terms of, um, you know, monitoring mosques. Uh, they would have to, um, uh, you know, engage in profiling, other kinds of things that are so considered so politically incorrect. And so since I doubt they will ever have the political will to do those things, I think we're, uh, we're going to keep seeing these things happen. Mm -hmm. I think right. one of the reasons why we're in San Angelo, Texas, is because trying to do this at a federal level uh, is because there has been so much compromise. I think our best success rate is getting to the, the local folks, pastors, ministers, sheriffs, uh, law enforcement, uh, teachers at the local level, that have not been corrupted, who are still have the courage to be able to see and do these things. Someone heard and saw these these individuals. They may not have been monitored properly, they may not have been on the radar screen. But I believe that our best success chances 
are getting the facts like we're doing tomorrow to the folks here in San Angelo to let them know what to look for and that when the talking heads come, they can sort through the chaff and understand exactly wah, 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 wah is exactly that. If they want to really get the facts, just like Joe said, look at the fundamental operational manuals that these groups are working well, it's going to be, come a time where they've got to understand that Islam really is not a religion, but it's more of a government or a mandate. Isn't that correct? Well, it is a religion, but it's much, much more than just a religion. That's one of the errors that we make in the West is thinking Islam is a religion like Christianity is a religion. It is not. Uh, it is a political system, a social system, commercial system, and it's, it's all-encompassing. And um, until we kind of grasp that and understand that uh, Islam doesn't feel like any particular geographical entity is, is fully submitted to Allah until the law is the Sharia and everyone complies with all the dictates of Sharia. So it is a religion. But it is also a political system, commercial, social, and everything else. Did you have something you wanted to add? I, I just think one of the reasons we need to wake up about all this is we're having our own military people being killed here in our country. Here in the state of Texas, we've already seen that happen in, in, at Fort Hood. These are our family, our yes. friends. I pastor a military church. The threat is now towards all of my church who are serving. And if we sit by passively as people who could do, have an impact, we're letting down our friends, and they need our help and support. Our government just needs to step up. We need to vote people in office who will help, who will protect. And it's time for American people to wake up. And if we're not careful, we're going to lose all that we've had, yet, that the, our forefathers provided for us. And exactly. so this ought to be a huge wake-up call. These men can explain to you what this was about. But it's somewhere along the line, people got to say enough is enough. And until exactly. we get that loud enough, nothing much is going to change. Yeah, absolutely. Ken, did you have a question you wanted to catch? In the initial report right after the Chattanooga thing, there was a report that uh, there had been a message apparently from an outside source going to the shooter that indicated that maybe this was a command performance. Do you think that it was a lone wolf effort? or is it part of a concerted, a coordinated campaign? Why don't you use the quote that you read from Brad Thor earlier about the term lone wolf. Well, Brad Thor, the author, just just tweeted a minute ago, how many lone wolves before you got a pack going on? We've had enough lone wolves taking place. Mm -hmm. I, I really do think there's more coordination than we're, we're being told by anybody. I've been traveling all over the country, uh, been involved in protecting military and others from a lot of stuff that's going on. And just the stories I keep hearing from different things, there's just too many things happening, too many different places across the country that's, that really threaten this nation. And so, I, you know, I, I have my ideas of who could be behind all of this, but there's something going on and the American people need to wake up. I think the question is, uh interesting from a law enforcement perspective, but it's also somewhat irrelevant. Uh, whether whether this this guy in Chattanooga got direction, you know, verbally or through the internet or something from ISIS or Al-Qaeda or some other group, is doesn't really matter. Uh, because he is of the same ideology and he's gonna and others are going to carry out these acts because they know what they're supposed to do whether or not somebody from overseas you know, goes ahead and tells them to do it. Right. It's the ideology that binds all of these guys together. And so whether he's a lone wolf or he took orders from ISIS is really doesn't really make any difference. It's the ideology that is in common and uh, it is the thing that ties all these things together. When you go out and plant your plants in the garden, some plants come suddenly some are different lengths and heights are all different. And that's really, the seeds have been planted, just like Mark said, by this ideology. When they break the surface, no one really knows, but no one has any doubt. Well, it started because someone planted a seed there. 
how tall it is or how quick it gets there. And we're going to see more of these instances occur because the seeds have not stopped being planted. And this is a spiritual warfare that we're in. It is absolutely a question of good versus evil. And as Christians, one of the key things and why Steve, what Steve does and, and Joe Carey, Reverend Joe Carey, do is so important is to wake up the spiritual side of America, our Christians, our Protestants, our Jewish friends, all of them to understand that in the end of times and that the, the way it's going to work, work out, if we as Christians don't have the courage to stand up and say these things, why can we expect, why do we expect Muslims to have the courage to do it? We want Muslims to stand up and, and scream and yell about this. The greatest abuser of, of Muslims are other Muslims. But what they have to lose is far more than what we have to lose. So we have to have the courage these men have, have done and, and preach all the time about it is as Christians stand up in the pulpit, stand up in your pews, stand up at your homes, and do that. And you've interviewed some people who've had some of that courage where they work, and we need more of that. Yeah. Mary, do you have a question? Uh, yes, regarding whether or not he uh, received a message uh, via tweet or <clears throat> from ISIS. <laughs> and with all of the worries everybody has about our lack of privacy, can you see the government saying, well, okay, now we're really going to monitor everything? Uh, you know, I, I see them saying, well, okay, now we're going to have to profile more of everybody. You know, it's not, yes, we know that they're not going to profile Muslims. We know, you know, I'm the first one that gets checked at the airport. Right. You know, always have been from the day one, you know, this gray-haired grandmother. But, I think a, the fear of losing more of our privacy too, you know, with a lone wolf thing and how are, I'm not saying this very well and I apologize for that, uh, just it's scary to think that in order to stop them we're going to have to lose more of our freedoms. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. It's the old uh, security for, uh, oh, I forgot, what's the, I, lost my train of thought. He who would trade liberty for security deserves to be or something of that effect. So I think uh, this is where political correctness is killing us. Uh, we don't need to profile everybody in the country. We don't need to profile or, or monitor you know, 95 percent of the people in the country. Uh, we know where this is coming from and uh, it's, it's hard to pitch sort of, but um, I think that that's the answer, is, is we need to focus our resources on the people that we know are more likely to engage in this behavior. But they're not going to be willing to do that because of the political correctness, and therefore it's going to, I think the government will take the opportunity to open it up to do more. Then uh, we won't defeat it. Right. You're, you're right. Yeah. And, and we. Political correctness has become a tool to be used against us. And the Muslim Brotherhood talked about that in, in the Article 4 of their uh, memorandum that says very clearly, we will destroy them by using their own hands and by their own tools. And whether it's the interfaith dialogues that we'll talk about tomorrow, or whether it's you know the freedom of religion umbrella they work under, or having to cast a wider net and getting people more suspicious. It's about striking terror in the hearts and minds of all of us. And there's nobody here today that five years ago did you think that the threat for the Middle East would come here. We just thought we were instant. That is no longer the case from an a Islamic ideology standpoint. So that's, that's the ground they've been prepping. And that's part of the ideology, not the religion, but the ideology of Islam is to prep the battlefield. So when they do finally get to that point, everything collapses because there's there's distrust in, in all of our systems, religion, our government, our leaders, our military. Steve talked about it, you know. So it's it is. It's it's all a not a conspiracy theory guy, but Islam's been doing this 
for 1,400 years, and they've got them all down pretty well. To your question, um, I, I understand your concerns because if we if we begin requiring the FBI to again begin monitoring mosques, they're going to take the politically correct stand. Well, why shouldn't we also monitor Baptist churches and Presbyterians and and Lutherans and everybody else? You know, put them all under the same umbrella. Um, but this is still, according to our Constitution, a nation run by the people. Those, the, our government electors, uh, our elected officials, are supposed to represent our interests. The problem is we need to make our voice known to them. And very few people are willing to take a stand and, and call your representative and say, this is what I, want, I feel, this is what I want you to do. You need to represent me. Too many people in this nation are taking a passive role, and it's to our, to our own detriment. I've had an opportunity to give this speech two or three times up in Washington, D.C., but. You know, I grew up, I've been 40 years in the ministry. I grew up under books like the Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey and Left Behind series and all those books. They have so permeated within the church that we have a thought process that runs through the church that this is the way it's supposed to be. We're all going to be raptured out of here before it gets too bad and we'll be gone so let's not do anything. And so what Christians have done for the last 20 to 30 years is, is we have pulled out of everything. Trouble is, we've woke up now and we've been left behind. Mm -hmm. And it's either time to wake up. You know, I hope the Lord comes, but I have no idea when He's coming. But I'm going to be salt and light right now. And it means I have to get involved. I have to stand and protect those around me. And the, the church is going to have to wake up and realize they're going to take some bold stands. Uh, the church is about to face some very difficult days. I've been in meetings with lawyers in California this last week. Uh, there's some very tough days that will make will be coming ahead if this culture doesn't shift. I'm not even talking about what we're talking now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking some of the other cultural issues that are about to unfold. And right now, too many people are too afraid to take those stands. Uh, we've seen what's happened to people who take stands across our nation. They're having their livings taken away from them. Their homes are being threatened and everything else. But these, these men and women have amazing courage. Until the rest of us join in and do the same thing, it's, gonna, it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well at all. So that's why I said a moment ago, I said, it's wake up time. Yeah. It's time to get up. This is, we were made for such a time as this. And this has been a nation built upon a simple truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. We either believe that or we don't. And those of us who do need to start standing up. So true. Wayne, I you think know, you we keep talking about you know, the problem we have, and it's a very serious problem. But when you look at the real root cause, you go back 40 years ago, we didn't have a Muslim issue. That's and we had a change in immigration policy. Right now we're importing 100,000 Muslims a year, a lot of, most of them from the Middle East, a lot of them are refugees, a lot of them are, uh, it's the fastest growing group in the United States. We've got 1.2 million now in 20 years, it's projected we'll have 6.3 million. So the problem's getting worse. We're talking about dealing with the problem, but the real problem is, is we're, you know, is the immigration. We're bringing them in, we're bringing the problem in. You, you know, the problem is getting bigger than we can deal with. Right. What's it going to take to, to wake up the politicians? I mean, is there any hope that we can reduce or stop the immigration of Muslims? Until you get somebody who's got the courage to take the job and do it right, maybe not. You know, I've been involved in Texas in the last two months with our last legislative session. I testified in the Senate, the House, the Governor's Office. I was with the Lieutenant Governor, the Attorney General, testifying on behalf of religious freedom laws. Most of those folded in the state as the legislature came to a conclusion. And the reason was big business stepped in and put the pressure on our politicians and they folded. Tony Perkins was in my church in March and he was sitting there before the sermon to preach, texting Governor Pence in Indiana on what was going to happen the next day in Indiana. And Pence said, We're in good shape, we'll pass the religious freedom. The next day, Pence folded. And they didn't do it. That's where you and I get involved. In San Antonio, they passed the, the, uh, the non-discrimination ordinance over the objections of the people. So what did we do this last time? We voted the mayor out, we voted a new mayor in, and we got rid of the ones who had something to do with all of that. And the church got behind that and made that happen. We, I think the last election for mayor, 30 some odd thousand in San Antonio voted, <clears throat> this time over 100,000. We, we were told today that maybe 20,000 first-time voters, evangelicals, went to vote in the mayor's election for the first time ever. That so, uh, well, we got rid of a uh, band of poop and we put in uh, Ivy Taylor. That church was behind that. We, I think, it was a huge shock to Express News. Uh, so the church can make a difference, but we've been sitting back quietly 
waiting for somebody else to do something. And the key is, wherever you're at, your locale, you need to step up and get involved. I'll give you encouraging news. I was just on a phone call last night with Brigitte Gabrielle. I'm the chapter coordinator in San Antonio for Act for America. We have uh, 300,000 members around the country, hundreds of chapters. And we were on a conference call last night with her talking about the number of politicians, uh, House of Representatives, and Senators. Our national convention is coming up in September. Five years ago, we had to go out and beg these politicians to come and speak. They are now lining up left and right and calling us and saying, we want to come and talk to your group. We want to listen to your group. We want to hear what you're having to say. So that voice is being heard at the national level, which is very encouraging because these are people who can take that message that you're saying, that we're all saying, and put some legislative power behind it and, and do that. But it comes from being organized. What Steve has done in San Antonio with his group, what Act for America does locally and nationally is having a difference. So we just need to continue to get people, just like organization, that's what's been so effective for the progressives. We're just slow to that game and we've got to realize that numbers and what CAT is doing, what you folks here in San Angelo have done, uh, the key to your success has been what? Organizing and focus and messaging. We need to do the same thing and, and that's starting to work. See, in San Antonio, we've been two years at this now uh, and we don't have a lot of money. We're churches and pastors, uh, but two months ago I had 120 pastors from around the city meet at my church for dinner. We had uh, Ivy Taylor come and sit down and talk with us. We worked through a strategy to help her and we helped overcome. Uh, she had no money. She was running against huge amounts of money. She was running against the police union. She was running against the fire union. She was running against Express News. She was running against local television. Castro and, system, yeah. Uh, uh, the whole San Antonio yeah. political system, which lanes left, and we were able to beat that. It can be done with a lot of hard work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and people getting involved. And that's, that's going to take that. And we got to do that local, state, and national. I do want to answer uh, your question from my perspective. I think um, when we're talking about terrorism and, and violent acts and jihad and all that, we need to make sure that we don't lump all Muslims together into that. The majority of Muslims in this country are law-abiding citizens who are, you know, contribute to their communities, doctors, lawyers, architects, and everything else. So, um, the, I, for me, the issue of domestic terrorism and immigration are two completely different issues. Um, this, what we're here together to talk about is the issue of terrorism and these jihadis. And uh, most Muslims that you're going to encounter in the United States are not going to be a part of that. So um, I just felt that I need to. Let me add one thing to that too. I, my favorite restaurant in San Antonio is Jerusalem Grills. Muslims run it. Uh, I eat there all the time. My wife knows it one of my first name bases. They give her a hug every time we walk into the restaurant. They bring my dinner to me. I don't even order it. They know what I like and everything. The other day, one of them came up to me and gave me a, a hug. He doesn't normally do that, normally shake my hand. He said, Preacher, you keep doing what you're doing. Your country's in trouble. And what you've been doing, I greatly appreciate. Wow. And, and then he says, I will pray to Allah for you. Well, he knows I disagree with him on that part. <laughs> but he and I are good friends. And I, I would trust him with my life. So there, he, he's got a point there. So. I, I would agree partially with Mark. I would disagree, though, that it, immigration is a key component of fighting terrorism. The, the, the issue is not the individual Muslim that's here, the right. restaurant owner, the, my neighbor, my friend. It's those that we don't know about. And because many of those who are here have been vetted, have been tested, have proven themselves, but so many you know, when we were only accepting 250,000 total refugees up until 1970, and then seeing that number go from 250 to 430 to 680 and now over a million, and the screening process, even the FBI admits that they can't, they can't review those. So I would simply say that alone is a threat that adds to the dilemma that we face and to his restaurant owner or to the friends, to the Muslim, the peaceful ones that are here. They don't want to see that happening. So they have a vested interest mm -hmm. in making sure, but there is nothing in place because our political leadership, and not just at the White House level, 
but at, the Congress has control, has some input to that, and they've let that go by. They're only now waking up to it when they see some of the stories and other things that are happening. Steve, you mentioned that you pulled together 120 different churches in your community. What was the key to doing that? We, we just, we got about several groups that, that meet on a consistent basis. I'm in one or two the others. We've just been building friendships. We've learned to trust each other. Uh, we, we, we have different uh, theological beliefs. Uh, we have different administrative ways we do our churches. Uh, some are denominational, some are non denominational. We're a hodgepodge mixture of people, but we hold common values. We hold a faith in Christ. We hold to the inerrancy of the scriptures, uh, Jesus Christ being the only way, those type of things. And we've built a common bond on all of that. And then we just want a good place to raise our kids. Up until two years ago, none of the churches were united in any shape, form, or fashion. In fact, I said on a national radio program the other day with Tony Perkins that. I wanted to thank uh, Mayor Castro for his work in San Antonio, uh, that his legacy will be that he united the church better than anyone's ever done it in the history of San Antonio, and we are probably stronger now than we've ever been. Up until just a couple years ago, there was really no reason to unite. It was a quiet, San Antonio was a quiet city, had its problems like any major metropolitan does, but it was a good place to raise your family, a good place to live with no really extra issues. Everything has blown up in the last two to three years. And so the church has had to react. And we've been running behind, you know, a couple years behind everybody else, but we're catching up now. And so we're not quitting either. Uh, the mayor of San Antonio the other day and talking with some of us said, the problem with the church has been you guys only show up when you don't like something. Mm -hmm. And then after you get your way or you don't get your way, you disappear. We don't hear from you anymore. And so we need to learn how to be active in a good way. And so we have a group of pastors that meet with the mayor for prayer. Good. We've had two prayer meetings sponsored by the mayor with over a thousand people showing up for a prayer meeting. It's wonderful. In San Antonio. That's happened twice now. North side at John Hagee's church, south side at one of our strong Hispanic churches. And we have had probably two of the best prayer meetings I've ever been to in my entire life life. Fabulous. And so we have a mayor. Uh, what kind of good mayor she can be? I don't know. I hope she does well because we stood behind her. We'll mm -hmm. see. But we have learned that we could put our resources together and we could impact an election. So now what we're doing is, is we're recruiting people to run. There are some people who are spending, they have the time, they have the money, and they are recruiting people. We're not just waiting for who jumps up and then trying to decide who to vote for. That's right. We're trying to put people into positions, talk them in, and then encourage them. In fact, one of my friends is training people in how to run. That's his background. Uh, so we're not only recruiting, but we're training and providing resources and trying to make that happen. I'm not involved. I ain't got enough time. I'm trying to pastor a church and, and other stuff. But uh, there are some people really working at that. So Christian communities work in a lot of ways. And I will tell you, the Protestants, the Catholics in San Antonio are working together. Uh, we're working very close together. So we have thrown out all the stuff that used to divide us because there's too much at stake now. The very, very nature of what this country is about is at stake. And so we can all, this we all live here, we all need to join together and work. So we have a good place to raise our kids, our grandkids. You know, used to I worried about my kids, now i got eight grandkids. I'm concerned about what's going to happen with them in the coming days. And uh, so it, this is a good fight. This is one of the times, again, for such a time as this, we've been raised yeah. up. And it's time to stand up and do what God's called us to do. It's definitely enough issues on the table today There's to bring us together. There's yeah. Right. Somebody I think had a question. Yeah. Mary? Um, two things. There's a couple here in town. He is a very well respected doctor now retired. And I remember a few years ago we had a um, Holocaust remembrance thing. And she and they had a panel. It's not a very good panel but whatever. She got up and said that the people most discriminated against in this room are the Muslims. And her husband is, as I said, a very well-respected uh, doctor. And she came out with a statement of, I am a citizen of Islam. And as I, yes, and as I be learned more, I'm thinking that, that really means that she 
feels that she does not belong to the United States. She does not belong to America. She does not uh, follow with, you know, what as we believe, you know. And it goes, and you bring up the lone wolf thing and not all Muslims are bad and all of that. And then I think about this young man that did the shooting in Chattanooga who graduated from high school and all of his friends said he was, you know, just just a regular guy. Right. It, you know, so, you know, you don't know, but how, I think that's the limit everybody faces, is how do you know who to trust? Especially out here, we don't have that many Muslims in town. Yeah. Not yet. Well, I think it's, you got to know people individually. I mean, um, and you, we shouldn't make judgments about anybody that we don't know, no matter whether they're Muslim, Christian, or anybody yeah, else. Sure. So I encourage people to uh, to befriend Muslims and get to know them and um, share the gospel with them, minister to them, care about them, love on them. Um, it, you know, to a certain extent, Muslims do feel besieged, and they feel like, well, if some, in their mind, crazy jihadi does something, I get the blame. You know, I'm the one who gets mistreated because some other guy did something. And we all, we, we should, could all know how that might feel. And so again, I'm, from my perspective, uh, as, a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, our role is to win Muslims to faith. And yes, terrorism is a, is a big problem and we've got to make some major changes in order to effectively battle against it, but we don't throw all Muslims under the bus, and, and even those who might even be potential terrorists, you know, God's grace can reach them too. We heard the story of Kamal Salim when he came, spoke to us. I mean, he was as devout as you could be in terms of hating America, hating the ideology and everything. And what, what finally cured him? The relationship, the interaction with those doctors, nurses around him that showed him a level of friendship. If we always put a barrier up to them, it's not surprising that they're going to feel one way, no different than if you were from any country or not even from any country, but from any other state. If you're not warmly welcomed somewhere and you feel like you're just an outsider all the time. Um, and I, I know Nabil Qureshi talks about when he when he came here, was here in med school, and one of his friends who was from Saudi Arabia came here and brought an entire suitcase full of gifts that he was going to give to all the families. Because one of the traditions they have is whenever they go to someone's home, they give out a gift to that person who is hosting. And after three years, that young student went home with a suitcase full of gifts because nobody had invited them to his home for that entire time. And yet we hear Karen Thomas who talks about having these young Afghan soldiers who were all Muslims, men and women, to her homes there in San Antonio and witnessing to them and having that kind of relationship. Steve, Steve answered the question, what was the key? It was relationships. And Joe sees it all the time in his ministry. My wife was at Walgreens last night. <clears throat> It was late at night, about 8.45. She had run up to get something. We live a couple miles from there. We have a large Muslim population in our community, very large. And uh, she was doing something, and there was a tap on her shoulder, and she turned around, and it was a woman in veil. And she says, could you help me? And she said, what do you need? She said, my daughter, I don't know how to get her hair fixed, would you? And so Jan sat there and worked with her for about 20 minutes. I'm looking at my watch going, I wonder where Jan is. She <laughs> so I checked up my phone so I know where she was. No. And, uh, but when they got through, and Jan showed her what to do, walked her through everything she needed, the lady suddenly reached over and hugged her and then started crying. She sat there and sobbed on her shoulder and then says, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping me and walked off. We see that a lot. And I will tell you, Village has one of the few Muslim ministries in the city. And I can't say any more past that. And I can't tell you how many we've baptized, but we have. So Praise we're God. seeing an impact. Yeah. We're seeing an, it's not a big one. I wish I could say big. I wish I could give you great numbers. But you start somewhere. 
And I'm a little suspicious because probably one of the reasons we have a very large Muslim population is because we have a military base right there and we have NSA right there. And so I do know some of the negatives about my community also from the police and from military intelligence has warned me of a couple of things. So there is that, but in a daily basis, you know, I'm going to say tomorrow in my message, one of the things that believers have to bring to the table is kindness. And it says kind to all. I don't get to pick who I'm kind to. I have to be kind to everybody. Now, I've got to stand for truth, and I've got to preach the truth. But my, I need to make everybody who comes in contact with me safe around me. Now, now do I need to be cautious and careful on something? Yes. And I have to do that, especially the position I found myself in. But I am still, they, they will know I'm a Christian because I have a doctor in front of my name? No. They don't know I'm a Christian because I'm a preacher? No. Because I go to church? No. They don't know I'm a Christian because of my love. And that's that's still the critical element that we need to bring. The church needs to step back up and get involved. We need to be bolder in proclaiming and talking about who Jesus Christ is. And we need to be better at reaching out in communities than we've been in the past. We've been too locked in our doors, celebrating quietly among ourselves. It's time, I'm, I'm really... I don't need an evangelism program. I just need the church to be the church out in the world. Yeah. Salt and light. And we could we could have an impact. Because we're seeing in other places in the world through Southern Baptists that I'm associated with, uh, we're seeing an amazing amount of Muslims coming to Christ in different parts of the world. Because uh, they are hungry for the truth. And they're having some amazing, amazing conversion experience stories. The kind that would leave some of us as Baptists a little confused by their stories because we, we're too reserved in how we do a lot of things. But they're pretty stunning stories of what God's doing in different parts of the world. So, uh, you know, I, we got to be cautious and careful, and we'll talk about all that tomorrow. But we also got to be salt and light, and we have to demonstrate the very presence of Christ in all that we do. Sarah, you had a question? I, I oh, 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 okay. Real quick. One second. And, okay. and then we'll get Erica. Your, your, your comment that she said she's a citizen of Islam. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a reason she says that. A couple of years ago, there was a, a an event in Dallas, or no, it was in Austin, um, Texas Capital Day, a Muslim Capital Day. Mm -hmm. The leader of CARE for in Dallas made this statement. He says, as Muslims, we are above the law of the land. And that's what that person was getting at. Yes. Because yes. They, they believe that Allah's law supersedes any man-made law. Right. This is why, this is what, getting back to what Mark said earlier, we can confront this, this problem of Islam politically, we can confront it militarily, and those are all good things. But at the end of the day, the only long-lasting term is to confront it spiritually, to change the ideology, to confront the ideology, expose it for what it is, and then offer them the truth. Well said. You'll, be, you'll be amazed, my wife and I travel regularly. I, I go around the country teaching at churches, that's, that's my ministry helping churches, helping Christians become equipped to engage Muslims, to, to engage the guy that they see at the 7-Eleven, to engage the taxi driver that they get into at the airport. And we also regularly reach out to Muslims. We go to Arab festivals around, around the country, the most prominent being in Dearborn, Michigan. They have a huge Arab festival there every year. And my wife and I have had several conversations with Muslims in Dearborn to where, like Steve was talking about a moment ago, you engage them with love, with respect, but being firm in your faith. Showing them love, showing them the truth, and you would be amazed how many times I've had a Muslim at the end of our conversation say, shake my hand, embrace me, said, thank you, I've never had this kind of a conversation with a Christian before. And then they'll ask me, will you pray for me? Mm. That is critical. Yes. And yes. And it is phenomenal. We need to reach these people. They are hungry. Like Steve said, they are hungry for the truth. Here's the cool thing. When you're talking with a Muslim, you don't have to convince them that God exists like you would have to if you're talking to an atheist. They already believe that. Mm -hmm. They already believe Jesus was born of a virgin. They believe that God has sent prophets throughout history to convey and speak on, on his behalf. So you're already several steps ahead of the game that you would be if you were talking to a non-believer. You've got a lot of common ground you can build upon. We need to take advantage of that. Let's see why I brought these guys. Yeah, kind of good, kind of good. Fair, what you was your question? You answered my question. Okay. <laughs> he's a mind reader, too. Read my mind. Yeah, he's a mind. I was just going to ask. I don't know what to say to the Muslims because we've always more or less been taught to be afraid of them, that they're all criminals and, you know, they're all here to ruin our country. Right. Although I know in my heart that they aren't. 
but still, yet. You, you talk know. with them like you do anybody else. Yeah. You're just friends we, with people. We just don't have any here that I've seen. Being a nurse for a hundred years, we used to have them come to our office <laughs> before I retired. You and look I very well all, for hundred. I was always. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I, want I was, to say that. <laughs> Uh, I was always very kind to them. Some of the nurses, you know, didn't right. like them at all. But I always did my very best to, to go out of the way to be nice to them. But it's it's difficult when you don't know. But do, do you have you done any of your training in our churches here? <laughs> not in San Angelo, not yet. And he's well, available. Well, let's any get it done. Yes. That's Either one of these guys are great at doing yes. exactly That's what we need. What? Mark's done two or three for my church. Yeah. He's trained my. We have a pregnancy center in San Antonio that sees two and a half thousand women a year. And we've saved about two thousand babies the last three years. But one of the things we started seeing happen about three or four years ago, I don't remember, it's been a couple of years ago that you came and did this, is we're having Muslim women coming into our pregnancy center to looking for help. And so he trained my ladies in how to deal with Muslim women. And it was probably one of the best training sessions we had. I've heard more comments about that because these women are coming in hurting, hurting, they're scared, they're frightened by all that they're facing. And we, we, we will share the gospel with everyone who walks into our center. And, but we needed to learn how to do that in a way that is not offensive to their right, culture and right. everything else. That's what we need. We need and so to hear. It helps. And we all don't. your people need a little bit of insight. Not a lot. Uh, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to be a friend and treat somebody right. Just kindness and a little bit of truth works very, very well. Mm -hmm. I had another part to my question, changing um, thoughts now. My email was full today from people saying, when is the military going to allow those guys at recruiting centers and all to have guns so they can protect themselves? The governor, I just saw before we sat down a minute ago, the governor of Oklahoma has approved that in Oklahoma they can start carrying. Great. I hope that's true. I, I, don't, I haven't verified that What's yet. What's our governor saying? I don't know. It's still early, but uh, I've been, we've been, you know, I was shocked when I go to, to Randolph Air Force, not Randolph, to Lackland. I'm right next door to Lackland. And uh, there's very, except at the gate, you'll not see a gun one anywhere. I know. That's I military know. policy. The military right? policy is not to, allow, not to allow that to happen. And this is not the first time it's happened at a recruiting center in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. It, it happened there, and nothing has changed. And there was a study that was all done uh, by the Pentagon. I know. And you can study this till you're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, you know what's going to stop that is having those folks being armed and being able to take down because I would suspect their shooting skills are probably pretty good. But but at the end of the day, we, we've got to wait for our leaders to make that political decision. And But again, it's just like what Steve said, if there's enough pushback, writing to your congressman, writing to your senator, calling them up and saying why aren't, and locally, statewide, and getting your mayor and getting, I mean, it's an issue. And if we begin to let people know these, these people are armed, They'll think twice or at least begin yeah, to reevaluate. That's what we know. Well, it's getting late. So, any closing thoughts from any of y'all? I have one quick question while they're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it says in John 10 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Excuse me, steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And it seems like encrypted in Islamic theology is killing, stealing, and destroying. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you all are talking about is as shepherds, as good shepherds, the church needs to understand what's going on and be able to reach out that hand and, you know, uh, to the extent of laying down our life, you know, for them. Well, part uh we tend to fear what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so part of what all of us yeah. do, uh, Joe and I especially, uh, is to try to help Christians understand Islam, understand Muslims, know where different things fit in the big picture, how to contextualize things, so that we're no longer fearful, we have understanding, and we feel free to love and embrace Muslims as uh, people that God created and that Jesus died for. 
So um, replacing fear and misunderstanding with love and compassion and a passion for uh, extending the kingdom of God in the Muslim world uh, is what we're about. Yeah, I can't, I can't speak on behalf of Mark, although I think I know him well enough that he and I share the same mindset. Um, but I will say this. It is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle between light and dark. Here's the thing. Who is Allah? Have you ever asked that question? Who is Allah? Think about this. If, if we as Christians believe the Bible to be the true word of God, and if we believe the story where it's recorded that Satan set himself up to be like the Most High, and for that reason he was kicked out of, out of heaven and took a, a, a significant portion of the heavenly host with him, and vowed to mislead as many people as possible from spending an eternity with the one true God. If you were in Satan's shoes and you wanted to fulfill that, that vow, how would you do that? What do you think the most effective way to do that would be? Wouldn't it be to, to create a, an ideology, a religious system that stands in direct contrast to everything Christianity stands for, everything the true God stands for? Yet this ideology has enough nuggets of truth and has enough, makes enough intellectual sense that it's appealing to the masses. That's what Islam is today. When you look at the attributes that define Allah in the Quran, it, it exactly matches the attributes that, that, that describe Satan in the Bible. That's who the author of Islam is. And it's no secret, even, even Muhammad, during his very first encounter with what he thought was the angel Gabriel, came to the conclusion he thought he was possessed by a demon. He ran home to his wife Khadijah and says, Woe is me, poet or possessed, never shall the Quraysh say that of me. Islam is born of Satan. That's why it's a spiritual battle. These people enemy. The enemy is an ideology that drives Muslims. Muslims are the biggest victims of the lies of Islam. And we need to rescue them. That's our job as Christians. I think that's a perfect way to end. I appreciate Amen. it. Roy, do you have anything else? No, we okay. just want to say thanks to Kat and all of her team of folks out here in San Angelo. We're glad to be back. Uh, we hope uh, we continue to pray, not just for San Angelo, but Texas and our country. But it's because of you, your involvement, your willingness to bring that education is what starts that. So we just hope this is an example for others who watch this to say, all you need to do is reach out to us, and Cats will have our email addresses on the bottom of this, but to reach out to us and we can bring a team like this to your community to say, give you the kind of education, the information you need to protect your community and at the same time, you know, witness and tell these people and release them from the burden they're under. And uh, so we just want to thank you and, and I want to say thanks to the team for coming out today. Thank you all. Thank you.